But IndyCar had the weekend off, and speaking of IndyCar, we have a very special guest in the studio. I'd like to introduce you to the race engineer of the number 27 Honda-powered Andretti Autosport machine that's driven by Alexander Rossi, Mr. Jeremy Millis, in the studio with us today. Jeremy, good evening, and thanks for coming on. Yeah, no problem. You forgot Napa. Napa. <laughs> always got to plug the sponsors yep and, and i'll tell you what that that, that that blue and yellow uh napa livery is just beautiful and classic i've uh, been in racing a long time i know i've got a couple of um rossi die cast i've got the indy 500 winner but then when they come out with the new car i said well i gotta get the new car so but uh good looking car that you work on there but uh so i just wanted to ask you quickly you know, about your background, I mean, were, did you grow up as a race fan uh, with designs on working in racing um, when you grew up, or did you just kind of find that your particular education and training had practical applications that led you into racing? Um, so one of my uncles had a, uh, you know, a machine shop that built race engines, so when I originally started, I wanted to be a, an engine builder, so I went to a technical college and was like, I want to build race engines. And then as I was driving, I was in Lima, Ohio, and I lived in Columbus, so it's like 120 mile an hour or 120, <laughs> 120 mile uh, drive each way. And I passed, every day I would pass this uh, Formula Atlantic team, which is like the feeder series to the IndyCar series back then. And I just stopped in one day and was like, hey, do you guys need help? And they were like, can you use a computer? And I was like, yeah. And then I started doing that for a while. And I was like, I don't want to build engines anymore. So <laughs> I went back to school and, <laughs> and uh, got an engineering degree and, and went from there. Now, you've uh, you've worked for uh, Panther Racing. Uh, you worked under John Menard. You were with uh, Penske for a while. Um, most re- yep. most recently, before working with uh, with the Andretti team, uh, you were with um, Sarah Fisher and Ed Carpenter, uh, where you worked with Joseph yep. Joseph Newgarden. Uh, that was your first gig yep. as the um, as a race engineer. Um, so you've uh, mm-hmm. you've so you worked your way up from the bottom, so to say. Yeah, um, I also did a stint with Bill Davis Racing uh, in NASCAR for a bit with Tommy Baldwin. But yes, you did. <laughs> I had, I had, yeah, I had, had enough. <laughs> <laughs> so I went back north. <laughs> uh, yeah, I remember. I remember when you, I remember when you were there. Yes, sir. <laughs> I still talk to Tommy a lot. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I talk to Tommy too as well. <laughs> <laughs> what a small world! You and Gray work together. Interesting, interesting. Yeah. So, I'm sorry, I send you my most deep condolences. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So now, yeah. so now, so you, you, so you've worked in IndyCar, you've worked in NASCAR. Now, uh, now, Gray, Gray, you've got a question about um, how the day-to-day operations different. Yeah, Jeremy, you know, you know how we operated in, in NASCAR and how how the, for for lack of a better term, the bureaucracy kind of starts out, you know, with your crew chief and you got your car chief and, and that kind of stuff, and it filters down. You have your shop foremans and things like that. You know, for our listeners out there, uh, do, how does the IndyCar shop operate? Uh, uh, does it operate in much the same way as a NASCAR shop does? And also kind of take us through a, uh, a, a typical race week where you, you, where you get back in the, in the shop on Monday morning and you start preparation in, in, in to, to go out for the next week. Um, I would say it operates, you know, it's just there's fewer people because we don't have to prepare as many cars. So there's, but it operates in the exact same manner. Uh, we just have different titles. Like uh, the race engineer in IndyCar racing is essentially the crew chief in NASCAR, and the race engineer in NASCAR would be the assistant engineer in IndyCar racing, and then it just kind of goes on down. The car chief, crew chief kind of thing works exactly the same. Uh, are you responsible as NASCAR? Are you responsible for basically? I mean, do you come in with your guy, your setup guys? And things like that, and you're responsible for the for the setup that's going to go in the car for the for the upcoming weekend, and, and all the particular changes and, and, and what you're gonna the package you're gonna install in the race car for the for the week. Do you kind of uh, set forth that protocol and then send it down to your guys to to, to prepare the car? Yeah, uh, like I said, it, essentially the same as NASCAR. So I, I get together with my simulation group and. And my assistant engineer and we we get together and we run through 
you know, first thing is look at what we did last year, what we tested, how we performed, and are we going to start there? Are we going to start somewhere different? And then we, we go from there and then run through as many simulations as we, as we can to get um, prepared for directions we might have to go because, as, as you guys know on the panel, that you might show up <laughs> you might show up with a car that you're expecting to understeer and you only have changes set up to or, or picked out to uh, fix understeer and you show up and you're loose and you're like, oh boy. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we, you know, go through and we just come up with a, a, you know, list of ideas and directions to go and then we move forward from there. As far as personnel on the road, do you, uh, how many people, uh, uh, are you uh, under your uh, direction at the racetrack to, to take care of the 27? Um, probably, let's see, I'd say 15 or 20 total people per car in IndyCar. Um, okay. so there's, there's four mechanics, a crew chief, then there's a data acquisition engineer, an assistant engineer, a race engineer, race strategist, which is on my car is actually the general manager of the team as well. Um, and then there's, you know, the truck drivers and other, other pit guys, so. Okay. Now, I did want to ask you about the the relationship between yourself and the race strategist, who Rob Edwards calls the strategy on the car. There, uh, do you guys confer very closely on um on strategy, or or does that kind of just lie with him, and, and you're more with the car, or or have have there been any times you guys are just been diametrically opposed to what strategy you should run? Uh, I would say. <laughs> uh, I would say Rob's braver than I am most weekends. <laughs> so, so a lot of the strategy starts out with the race engineer and the assistant engineer. We do a lot of prep work and then we hand it off to Rob because he doesn't have as much time to dedicate to that because he's running the team, the entire team, not, not just the IndyCar side, but the Formula E team and the uh, supercar team in Australia and all that. So, so we prepare, you know, these are, these are what we think is going to happen. This is what we think is going to happen. And, uh, and then we get together uh, before the race, and we have about a 30-minute meeting with the driver and our engine tech from Honda. And we go over what we think is going to happen, and we go from there. But a lot of times, you know, especially especially road course racing, oval racing is pretty much um, a standard uh, strategy because you can get trapped by yellows really easy where you don't in road courses. So road courses it ebbs and flows a lot. So you just have to be ready to make a, a quick decision. So we are analyzing data live as we're, as we're watching the race, you know, what our gap is, where we're going to come out on track, which was what we call a ghost car. So we have a ghost car set up for where we're going to be on track. So if we're going to come out into like, you know, an open, an open slot between cars and things like that. Mm-hmm. Mm hmm. Hmm. See, now, now Gray often mentions whenever NASCAR is on a road course that they work the strategy backwards. Is that is that similar yep. in IndyCar as well? I, I, the pre-event, yes. That's that's how we do it. Like, you know, we're trying to – like, one of the things when we were doing Iowa, because the, uh, the tires had such a, a fall-off, it was how many pit stops are we going to do? And it was, well, if we do – an extra pit stop in here, our lap time is going to be this, and we'll actually get to the checkered flag 20 seconds before the car that does two stops or, or did three stops, however many, <laughs> the minimum. I think it was three, and we were going to do four. And uh, so it was, you know, oh, we'll get there 30 seconds before. That's if we can get through traffic as quickly as, as, as we predicted and if there's no yellows and things like that. So, yes, you start by working backwards and coming up with, okay, these three strategies seem to work, and then you kind of watch what's going on in the race to see which one you need to pick, I would say, is what, what mainly mm -hmm. happened. Excellent. Now, Joe, you've got a, you've got a question, sir? Yeah, I was actually uh, kind of wondering, you've dealt with, with Joseph Newgarden, and you've, now you've dealt with Rossi for a little bit more than a season and a half here. Can you compare mm -hmm. maybe a little bit of what you see out of out of both of them from a feedback perspective? Like, is Rossi similar to Newgarden or a little bit more animated? I mean, can you describe a little bit of that? Uh, yeah, like, I would say their driving styles are, are super similar. Um, like, it was really nice because, like, the kind of setups I developed with Joseph kind of continued to work with Alex because they're both 
you know, they're both very heartbreaking, and um, they both, uh, like, even, even like, their throttle tip-in, you know, we have maps for how the throttle map comp- tips into the engine. They, they both run very aggressive throttle tip-ins, so they, they like to rotate the car with the throttle a lot. And so, like, it, it was very similar. And, like, at, when I was at ECR, we were the only car that had that super aggressive throttle tip in. And when I'm at Andretti, we're the same thing. We're the only car that has a super aggressive tip and everybody else is like this really digressive curve. And we're, you know, very progressive curve and it's, it's really different. So yeah, I'd say they're, they're very similar. Like Joseph is much more, uh, I don't know. He's better on TV <laughs> than Alex is. Alex is, Alex is just as funny and, great to hang out with as, as Joseph, but he, you know, on TV, he's just kind of quiet and like, I just want to do my job and get out of here. So whereas Joseph's like, yeah, let's talk. And <laughs> so. Well, let me, let me ask you this one. Whenever you've got a guy like, well, like Alex, who for my money, I look at him and he's like a bulldog on a racetrack. I mean, that guy just, he's tenacious. He goes after it each and every lap. He, you know, he's giving it everything. Do you get, how, how anxious do you get on that? On, up on that box, uh, just whenever you see him, like St. Pete, when we see him at Detroit, I mean, how how tough does it make you, or how stressed do you get whenever you watch him try to tear through the field and make some moves that he does? <laughs> I, he has so like with Joseph, his first couple of years, we there was there was a race in Brazil that we stopped because we had no more front wings. <laughs> and Joseph was really embarrassed at the end of the race because they came and gave him a trophy for the fastest race lap, but yet we had had to stop because we're like, we, we don't have any more front wings. You've hit everything. <laughs> but with Alex, I haven't had that yet, so I haven't ever had to, like, pull the reins back. I just, like, let him go. Like, he, like well, you're, you're, you obviously know what you're doing, and if you want to go high line and try and pass everybody, like, I'll be it. Go for it. So. Fair enough, fair enough. All right, now, Richard, you've got a couple of questions. Um, yeah, one of the things that, um, you know, you, you see a lot in, especially where I come from in the Formula One world, is driver coaching from the standpoint. How much do you really have to do that? Or is it, you know, I, I often see it's the Formula One guys, they've got so many people doing everything that they're trying to hit every little mark possible and and some of this driver coaching goes a little bit over the top to my mind um is that something you have to do with the guys in indica so when i was at ecr um well when i was at well we'll call it sarah fisher racing then it became cfa racing, then it became ecr <laughs> uh, so when i was at that group of teams <laughs> uh and running joseph we had first we had barry waddell as a driver coach and i i give him a lot of credit for bringing Joseph to where he was. He like, and myself, honestly, like mm-hmm. at that point, Joseph and I were uh, struggling too hard to make a car that was able to make the ultimate lap time, but it was way too hard to drive. So we rarely would transfer rounds and qualifying because Joseph couldn't do the perfect lap, but if he could, it was like, Oh yeah, we're fast. Yeah. So Barry kind of pulled the reins back on us and was like, you know, just give him something he can drive and let him go do his craft. And so yeah. we started doing that and we started having success. And then when yeah. it came ECR racing, we have Lee Bentham, who is also a super, super coach. <laughs> and he does a lot of other stuff. Like he does dart fish and things for yeah. the team. Yeah. Um, so yeah, at that team we did at Andretti, we have zero uh, driver coaching. So i uh, I have to kind of step back into that rule, which mm-hmm. I don't really enjoy doing. I, I prefer having a driver coach because especially if the driver is doing something wrong, I would prefer somebody else talk to him that way that, yeah. you know, we don't get yeah. any feathers ruffled between the two of us. If I'm saying, Oh, you're doing this wrong. It's easier that, for well, me you get in the car and drive it, you know? Yeah, that wouldn't work. I wouldn't fit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, it's, it's interesting. You mentioned that about, uh, jo- you know, Joseph being a very, you know, to start with putting the, you know, a complete lap together. When I first started out in Formula 1, I was working with Takuma Sato at Honda, and he was exactly the same. I worked that with him too. Was just <laughs> so fast. So, so fast. Yeah, if, if you and like qualify, one of the bravest guys. Oh, just a completely <laughs> crazy man. But if, if, you know, if you could qualify based on sector times, the guy would be phenomenal. But, uh, you know, it's interesting yeah. how... 
you know, learning that sort of craft of racing and that diligence of, of putting a complete lap together. It may not be as spectacular and you may not get, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the, the car going sideways as often, but I'll tell you, your spare parts guys are a lot happier. <laughs> yeah, I, I agree. Like, um, like uh, J.R. Hildebrand, I worked with him at Panther and he, he's one of those guys that, man, there's, there's always, there's always really good segments, but it just never, it never got put together to, yeah. to, to, you know, produce the right lap. And there's a lot of times, even with Alex, we'll be at weekends and we'll be like going through the timing and scoring and we'll be like, Oh man, we're like seventh here. And like our best segment, we're second, but we're like fifth to seventh for everywhere. And I'm like, yeah, but we're, we're second. Right. So <laughs> <laughs> like, no, the, the guy who's got three first also has a 15th down here. So, you know, we just got to stick with what we're doing and, and yeah. go forward. And I guess you sort of try and build that into the car set up a little bit as well, especially if you're, I guess you're at some of these road courses where you have quite distinct, you know, setup of the track and, and sectors of the track. You've got to try and find that balance so that you're not really fast in one sector, but then that compromises, compromises the rest of the track. And I guess that's working with the driver style and the driver setup to try and, and find that balance. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. There was a, uh, a year with Joseph at Baltimore, there was a chicane on the front stretch and Joseph yep. was a half second faster than any other car through there. But we were like 12th in every other sector, but it like we qualified like fourth. So we're like, okay, we'll take it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, and one of the things that, uh, you know, obviously uh, has been one of the hot topics in IndyCar this season, but uh, any chance that you guys are expanding your driver lineup next year? I mean, there's lots of rumors about the McLaren <laughs> thing and that, but <laughs> I have no idea. No, you'd be the last to and know. Then that, sure. and that, yeah, yeah, exactly. And then the rumor of Scott Dixon coming over, that would be yep. that would be pretty amazing. I'd love to work with that guy. So. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, I don't know. I, I heard a rumor today that uh, Alonso was headed back to Ferrari now that Sergio was out of the picture. I'm like, wow, you wrote that fast. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. So, but um, you know, now now that we're we're talking about this and, and the moves, I, I want to ask you, uh, Jeremy, about just like the overall health of the series. Um, there was a lot of optimism coming into this year um, with the new car, uh, new teams on board. Um, but then then we've got you know a couple of of you know kicking the pants things like Phoenix being dropped. Um, and things like that. But, uh, I mean, overall, uh, is the mood around the paddock and the garages uh, still quite optimistic? Um, uh, you know, the NBC deal for next year and whatnot. Um, uh, you know, what's everybody's, you know, kind of feeling about the overall health and, and well-being and future of the series? Uh, well, <laughs> there's optimists and there's pessimists and there's realists. And <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, I think everybody's really excited about the new TV package because I, it, it seems like they're the, they're willing to put in more effort than the former group did. So everybody's really excited about that. Um, I think from what I've read, the, the streaming rights aren't quite as good as the old old streaming rights were. So that that's a negative. But I think everybody's pretty excited about that. And then, I mean, tracks come and go. I I love oval racing, but. Man, if we could have street courses every single weekend, like we pack fans into them, and they're great events because I don't know what it is about racing, but racing in general is dying in my book. <laughs> like I, I watch everything, and everything's TV ratings are down. But but so is the NFL. The NFL TV ratings are down. NBA rate TV ratings are down. So so I, I don't know. I, I guess to me, I kind of watch just how many people show up. Because I, I, you know, I can't see how many people are watching on TV, and and like a lot of our street course races are, are crazy packed, and they're great atmospheres, and people can come and get their, you know, because people have a much shorter attention span these days, it seems like, so they can come and get their thirty minutes of IndyCar, and then they can go, you know, drink some beer and eat some hot dogs and walk around and, you know, have have a, you know, carnival atmosphere almost. Yeah. You bring up a good point there because I think the street, when they have the street things, they get the the town or the community involved and it becomes more of a festival type type atmosphere. And it probably does bring in, it's a once a year thing and they bring out uh, a festival of speed, if you will. They bring out, uh, bring out the fans. Yeah. I mean, if you look at like, I love airplanes and that's my passion. <laughs> 
And if you look at, like, the Red Bull Air Racing Series, like, they go to Texas, and it dies after one year. And they come to Indy, and it's a pretty good show. But then they do the one, I think it's downtown Budapest, and it's, like, half a million people piled in the streets just watching them. It's, like, I think that's what most events, and I think that's what NASCAR needs to move move to as well. I think it would help them a bunch. Yeah. Yeah, I think there's a whole new generation that is not as captivated by automobiles and auto- automobile racing as us older guys have been. You, you know, it's like uh, my my son is 20. He's had his driver's license since he's 16. Still rides his bicycle everywhere. He doesn't want to own a car. He's not worried about it. But uh, there, and there's a, tons of young people like that with these short attention spans. So I, I guess it's crafting the sport or crafting the event uh, to make it more palatable to the younger generation. And and to your point, these street circuits, you know, where there's so much going on, you can watch a little bit of the race or you can you go see this and live band playing in, in turn three or, or whatever. And uh, just, just to try to reach out to that, that new generation. And uh, sometimes I think races just need to be shorter. No, not IndyCar races. It, the two-hour, I think the two-hour uh, – uh, thing there works well, but um, now Jeremy, I wanted to ask you about the IndyCar schedule because uh, my good friend Robin Miller often writes that that the the IndyCar schedule is absolutely grueling on the crews where they have this compressed schedule and these races back to back and testing in between. Um, and you're you're a family man, um, you know you've uh, you know Robin writes that you keeping these guys away from their family for so long because they don't have shop guys and road guys. But, uh, I mean, is it is is it that grueling? And, and is there a way to kind of fix that? Um, so having worked in NASCAR, I would say that we <laughs> we spend we, – we, we work more hours than most of the NASCAR crews, but we do it for a shorter portion of the season. So – I think it kind of equalizes like, like we got back from Toronto and so we landed at like two o'clock in the morning, got home back at the shop at nine o'clock the next morning, you know, so I like got to bed at three, got to the shop at nine, worked until probably five. And then I came to my house and worked until probably 10 or 11 and then back the next day, you know, to kind of do the same thing from eight to five and then back home. And then I worked from seven to 11 at home. And then we got on a bus and we went to St. Louis at from seven. We got on the bus at seven in the morning, went to St. Louis, tested from one o'clock in the afternoon till 11 o'clock at night, loaded up at midnight, drove back home and got home at five o'clock in the morning <laughs> to, to go in the next day at uh, noon to get the cars ready for mid Ohio. So wow. yeah, it's, it's hard. <laughs> yeah, it's fun though, isn't it? And, and for, the, and for that for that time compressed time period from what like you guys start and, and of course you have your your all uh, your preseason tests at Sebring and stuff in late February and then you start and start mid March and then you run through September. Obviously, that is as very it is very compressed. But when it comes to the off season, you guys have the longest off season in in, in most sports. And I know a lot of, of smaller teams kind of they're, they're they lay off people, they furlough people and stuff. You you had the fortune of working with 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 one of the larger teams that has other interests. Uh, what goes? What do you guys do in the off season at, at, at Andretti? How does how does your off season compare to like you know NASCAR? We have a short off season where you know we work probably our, our busiest time of the year is from. Uh, Thanksgiving to, uh, you know, two weeks, be- two, three weeks beyond uh, Daytona. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> um, it's kind of the same. So I think the main difference between NASCAR and IndyCar is we just don't have as many, you know, as, as large of group, as many personnel. So when there's, there's only really one team, which I would say is probably Penske now. There used to be Penske and Ganassi that have the capability to do much development work during the season, except for like a little bit of seven post testing. Well, I mean, a lot of seven post testing, but no, no major part development during the season. Cause you just don't have the personnel at the show to do it. So when our off season comes, it's bam, we're full mode, you know, to trying to develop the car to go quicker. Okay. So it's, it's, it's 
it's really busy. <laughs> so, okay, so like when I was at, yeah, your, your design and your your design and development ramps up after set. What you're saying basically after September, and you start doing your simulation and use the shaker rig and the seven posts and all that. That all that stuff ramps up and continues through through the off season. Correct. Yeah. Well, we we still we still seven post test and wind tunnel test and all that during the season, but that that's as much as we can do. It's it's when we're in the off season is you know product design so Mm -hmm. we all we all learn how to use cat again (laughs) because we haven't used it for six months and then we start you know filling up the machine shop and backing them up and yeah so it's basically that it's it's all it's all design work in in the off season and i use you were saying that some teams you know uh, lay people off and i would say that i don't know of any teams that are except for teams that maybe might close their doors but I don't think anybody has the okay. ability to, yeah. to do that anymore, which right. is that's okay. a good thing. <laughs> that, is a good, that, is, that is a good thing. I mean, you know, we, I, I've heard where some team, you know, and, and of course I, I'm, I'm basing my limited knowledge on things I've read, you know, in years past and stuff. But, uh, yes, yeah, that, that is good because we had heard, you know, that some teams, some of the smaller teams that just didn't have the work and the capability would would furlough some folks during the uh, and then used a lot of contract labor and stuff like that during the uh, mm-hmm. during the season. Yeah. Yep. I tell you, there's there's been years when <laughs> when the team has talked to the, when uh, the team is like offered or, or mentioned uh, maybe you know giving you a few mo- or two months off, <laughs> and it's like and it's kind of tempting. <laughs> 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 like no pay yeah i think i can i think i can swing that <laughs> like, but two months to just uh oh. <laughs> just now now joey you've got another question yeah um kind of i've talked to rossi and a bunch of other drivers about this because we have always been from the media standpoint we've always had to compare what the old kit did versus this universal aero kit but from a from an engineering perspective I mean, what are some of the challenges that, that you face in trying to get the edge whenever you have a, a universal aero kit that, you know, 1 through 24 on the grid has? I mean, how do you what, – what, where do you try to find that edge? Is it the damper program? Is it is it little mechanical things? I mean, what can you all do to try to get that edge every weekend? It's, it's tiny little bits in every single area and adding them up, you know, like uh, the, the uprights that – the tires actually bolt to the spindle that the wheel bolts to, you know, finding a tenth of a horsepower there and then finding, you know, two pounds of drag in the wind tunnel and, oh, we were able to take three pounds off the car, so now we've got a better weight distribution. It's it's adding, it's the sum of many minuscule changes is what makes you faster with the universal error kit. I guess, and then to that point, I mean, which do you enjoy a little bit more from an engineering standpoint? Did you enjoy what we had previously, or are you really enjoying what you've got now? Uh, I mean, I, I think they're kind of the same for us because they're both still given to us, right? We can't we can't go out and design a new wing or anything like that. So for us, it's kind of the same thing. It's just both en- engine manufacturers have the same product now, so... There's no, there's no excuse that oh we're not going to be good at this circuit, but we'll be really good at this circuit anymore, right? So now you have to be just as good as everybody at every circuit. Whereas with the Honda Aero Kit, we were really good on super speedways and average on road courses and street courses, and really poor on short ovals. Now we have no excuse, and we have to be as good as everybody else all the time. So I think that's really the only difference. To us, because you know, like I said, it's, it's given to us from the manufacturer before. So, all right, now Richard, you got one more before we? Uh... Yeah, well, I got, I got maybe two, maybe sneak a third in there as well. Well, I've been... um, <laughs> sorry. Um, so, one of the things that I found most interesting, and I guess I, I get this, and uh, coming from the you know the Formula One background over in Europe, and obviously with your you know driver, it's a you know potentially a slightly difficult question to answer, but. You are seeing, you know, more and more guys coming over from, from Formula 1. You know, I mean, you've had Takuma Sato, Rubens Barrichello, obviously Alexander Rossi, Max Chilton, guys like that, you know, come over and be successful. Um, mm-hmm. And they're often sort of introduced as, oh, this guy from Formula 1 and all this sort of stuff. And 
I find that a little bit frustrating because these guys are, are they're either called the retired Formula One driver or a Formula One reject, and I still find that massively unfair <laughs> because these guys are all super fast and. When you get to the Formula 1 level, the IndyCar level, and NASCAR level, the, the difference between the top guys and the second and, you know, even the top guys and the bottom guys is, is so minute that it's, you know, yeah. you, it's very unfair to turn around and call these guys oh, a, you know, a has-been or whatever. And in a way, I wish that these guys would come in and people wouldn't talk about their Formula 1 background as much because, you know, they're drivers, they're racers, they're, they're damn good at what they do on their own level. And I think it can be a little bit disrespectful to these guys at times. Yeah, I agree. Like, um, I mean, there, there are some guys who, like Max Chilton, I don't put him on the same level as Alex. I think I'd agree with that. Really. <laughs> right? And and Rubens was kind of on the downward swing of his yeah. career. I mean, and I came worked, over here and kind of, yeah. kind of floundered, but... When you saw Alonso hop in the car at Indy and in, you know, five laps, he was, like, right at speed, and he came in, and we were like, oh, why weren't you flat here? And he's like, well, my my foot wanted to be, but my brain was not ready for it. <laughs> <laughs> you know? So, it's like, you, you, it's very I, – I, here's the difference. When I – when we worked – having worked with Alonso at Indy, the interesting thing about the very, very top drivers is they'll come in and tell you, very limited what the car is doing wrong. Like, it's understeer, it's oversteer, period. Yeah. The guys who are just just a notch down, you know, just that couple tenths off, they're always like, we might find something that reduces understeer, but it's more uncomfortable to drive, and they won't deal with it. So they'll say, yeah, it was an understeer reduction, but it was it was a bad understeer reduction. Yeah. Whereas a guy like Alonzo will be like, yeah, it was understeer reduction. Bam, let's do it. <laughs> like, yeah. I, remember, I remember with Alonzo, one of the things – we, you know, at Indy, you kind of gradually trim out to go faster and faster, and he was, like, stunned at the end of the first day why we didn't just show up with the fastest car we could possibly do, and we're like, well, yeah. it doesn't really work like that. Yeah. <laughs> and, you've got, and you've got, you know, like a, a month almost to work through it rather than, you know, two, half, two 90-minute sessions like having a Formula 1 car. Yeah, exactly, right, yeah. Um, and it's... So- and you're you're on the edge more at Indy than you are on a road and oh, street yeah. course. Like it, you can save the car on a road and street course ninety percent of the time. On an oval, you, you can't. <laughs> every so I guess uh, you know Indy every ten seconds you're a blink of an eye away from sticking it in the wall, aren't you? At a pretty high speed. <laughs> yeah, um, and a and a, a hundred and fifty g impact. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, that wakes you up pretty quickly, I'm sure. Um, another question I have is. One thing I've always said, and especially you know, having lived over here for a while now, there are one of the things that I think IndyCar struggles with at times is there are so many fantastic road courses, and especially road courses in this country. I mean, brilliant, brilliant road courses that IndyCar just doesn't go to, whether that's for financial or political reasons or whatever it may be. If you could pick any course that you don't go to now and you take an IndyCar to, where would it be to race? Yeah. Um, well, I'd, I'd go back to Watkins Glen. I love that place. Yeah. It's so fast and so high commitment. And um, I like Mossport. You, you said this yep. country, but wow. Mossport again. Yeah, this guy. This guy. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, I don't know. I'd have to think. I, I guess my thing was I love high commitment circuits like like Road America Elk, yeah. or uh, you know circuits like that mid-ohio is for sure one Um, yeah and i I think sometimes when you look at some of these you know i think code is a great circuit out there in texas but it's almost you know with the way it's designed these modern formula one circuits it's just too anemic almost you know there's a guy can you know a driver can make a mistake and he just runs across a six acres worth of, of asphalt that doesn't really cause him any trouble and he gets back on and tries again you know, some of these circuits that yeah. you guys go to, uh, you know, you're in you're in a farmer's field if you make a mistake. And uh, <laughs> it's great to it's great to watch. I love it. And final question. Uh, I'm on yep. a, a sort of a, an enforced hiatus from motorsport at the moment. So if you've got any jobs going, you know, you've got Frank's details. Just, uh, you know, let Frank know. I'll, I'll give you a call. OK, <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, it seems like we always need people like in like Indy car series, the. The, I don't know if NASCAR is the same, but it seems like the age of the workforce is really going up at a linear rate, like one year <laughs> every year. 
And it doesn't seem like there's young people coming in, so we're really struggling to yeah. Like when they yeah, yeah. when they talk about adding cars every year, I'm always like, where are we going to get people? Yeah. I like. <laughs> it's a very it's a hard industry, isn't it? I mean, as you say, you know, especially for you guys, the, the sort of hours you work. I mean, that's all I've ever done pretty much has been motorsport, and at the moment I'm working for a, an engineering company that isn't in motorsport. And you know, as soon as it hits four o'clock, that place is empty, and I'm like, yeah. you know, it, I just don't. It, it's it's quite hard to motivate yourself when you've grown up in that environment and people who haven't worked in motorsport don't understand that, you know, the, the getting home at three o'clock in the morning after a test event or a race or whatever it is, it's exhausting, but you know what? It's so much fun in a very strange and perverse way. <laughs> it is, it, but well, it's the competition and it's the, yeah. it's the team aspect that I keep because, doing. Like, you know, I can't, I've I can't looked at getting out. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. No, I mean, I can't drive a car for, to save my life apart from a road car but you know so for me as a you know I, I was lucky I was able to combine my engineering background with motorsport which was my you know something I enjoyed as a kid so I've been very very lucky to be able to combine those two but you know as you said the competitive edge of it because you know if you're if you're there till you know 10 o'clock then somebody else is going to be there till 11 o'clock well that's, that's yeah. there's, pe- <laughs> there's people in the sport that work in the sport and then there's racers yeah, and that's the difference. Yeah, for sure, for sure. That's oh. what I like. That when I said I come home and I work a few more hours, like this is the we just built a new house, and this is the first time I've ever had a home office. So normally I would just stay at work and work, late, you know, really late at work. And now I can come home, and it's like my favorite thing to do is like come home, log into the VPN, and just get back into it. And I, yeah. I really, and, really, yeah, a lot of people yeah, don't understand it. that. It's a very <laughs> yeah, it's great, isn't it? It's a very uh, it's a very strange lifestyle that people live in racing, but it's uh, it's quite addictive. Um, yeah, no, it's good fun. Uh, Jeremy, you have been a great guest tonight. Um, you know, now IndyCar is off to Mid Ohio, which is pretty much your home Grand Prix right there. You're uh, from, yeah. you're from Ohio. Um, you've probably been to the track as a kid. Um, I, word on the street is that you grew up in the hood. In Ohio, <laughs> yeah, uh, although Ro- although Rossi says Rossi says that uh, you think you're hood, but you're not. But uh, anyway, <laughs> so uh, I, generally what we do, we always make picks for the race. And um, I, who, who do you who do you like, Jeremy? You, you think maybe that Rossi kid's going to win in Mid Ohio? I I think we have a good shot. We didn't test there, so I don't know kind of where our performance is. It was one of the tracks we we chose not to test at because we were pretty pretty strong there last year. Um, but if you look at the recent test coming up, it looks like Robert Wickens, he, he had a half second on the field at the last test. So it looks like they'll be pretty strong. So yeah. and, he deserves a win, I think, was, doesn't he? Dick, yeah, man, that guy's a masher. <laughs> I like him a lot. And it's funny because him and Alex keep running into each other, but like <laughs> literally 10 minutes afterwards, they're like, Oh, what are you doing this weekend? And they're like, you know, off and chummy again. So <laughs> yeah, the media oh, try to make something of it, don't they? And uh, if you ask what the drivers really think, a lot of the times they're, you know. Well, I it, think they're they're angry for they're angry for a few hours, right? And then it's like, ah, whatever, next one. So. <laughs> because probably in, if the roles were reversed, they'd have probably done exactly the same thing. Oh, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's so it's so funny because last week our guest was um, James Hinchcliffe's James Hinchcliffe brother, Christopher, who wrote the book. Uh, Jason Checkers, and he was talking about uh, Wickens, who he's known since he's like 10 years old. He's like, oh, Robbie said this, and Robbie said that. I'm like, okay, I've never called him Robbie, but uh, thank you for that. So, but, um, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Wickens will be good in mid-Ohio. So will Rossi, um, and let's go throw around the panel quick for a pick. Uh, Gray, who you like for uh, mid-Ohio? So how can you go against Scott Dixon? Uh, you, you work for yeah. Alexander Rossi? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah and yeah, and he wasn't he he had two massive crashes at the last test yes he did yes he did so and they weren't they weren't fast there last year they finished ninth there last year i think or eighth there last year so yeah that's yeah. great isn't it damn there you go there you well, go I mean, all right he's, lead, he's leading the points and he's won there more than anybody so yes gonna, yes he has that, sure. that's a that's that's a good pick gray richard who do you like who do you like from mid ohio um, I'm going to say Joseph Newgarden. Always a good pick, yeah. Newgarden can win any day. Joey, who you like? Uh, well, first off, 
I'll say that it's nice to have Pietro Fittipaldi come back after oh, yeah. his injury. He's coming back this this weekend at Mid Ohio, so yeah. it's really good yep. to see. Uh, that said, um, Jeremy, thanks for coming on the show. It's been fun, but I'm going to have to go with Pietro's teammate Sebastian Bourdais this weekend. Another, yeah. <laughs> another good pick right there. But I'll I'll just go out on a limb and I'll go with Rossi. Uh, just because I like Jeremy, I, I think. Yep, I think you've uh, you've got this down. So, um, uh, but you know, Jeremy, thanks again for coming on. But let let us let you go. I know um, you 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 know you're busy. You probably want to get back to the to the laptop or get back to the family. So, uh, uh, just let us know where we can follow you on social media. Uh. <laughs> I'm not really on it. Okay, <laughs> yeah. I have a Facebook so. account. That's about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. I, I, yeah, I noticed your last tweet was in 2016. <laughs> <laughs> so, but but we, but we can follow. We, we can follow the team. You know, Andretti. Yeah. Is Andretti on track, right? Or we can follow. Uh, yeah. Yep. Alexander Rossi. Um, IndyCar.com. <laughs> you can uh, catch up with stories there. Uh, some of them written by Mr. Joey Barnes. So. Uh, Hey, social media is overrated, man. That's all I can say. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Well, I, no, I don't so. think I could control my tongue. I'm not that good at it. So. <laughs> I've had to delete a number of things. That's all I can say. <laughs> I can't afford the fines. <laughs> <Yeah, I just, laughs> Jeremy, I've enjoyed catching up with you, and I, when I see Tommy again, I'll, I'll give him your regards. Yeah, and Slugger, if you see him too. Oh, I see him. He's oh, got. He's got. Slugger. He's got a. He's got a gig with Toyota now. So oh, he's so just living the good life right yeah, now. Yeah, I think yeah. Right oh, now yeah. He's, he's doing all the NHRA stuff for Toyota, so I imagine he's in Sonoma. Oh, is he? Weekend. Yeah. yeah. No, yeah I run into him from time to time. I see Tommy about oh once or twice a month, so uh, yeah, we'll uh, yeah we'll let him know we we caught up. <laughs> all, all right. Well, I well, guess. Yeah. Thanks again. Thanks again for coming yep. on the show uh, again. Guy Jeremy Millis from uh, Andretti Autosports, uh, keep your eye on that 27 car. Um, championship contender for sure. If not this year, certainly next. So, uh, 